Um, so it looks like we're going to have a conversation amongst ourselves, which is, you know, sometimes in a conference like this, in a big conference like this can be very uh, difficult to get. So we're going to make the best of circumstances and we're going to have a very informal. So what Jyotsna and I had planned was actually quite different. So we're going to do it slightly differently. Uh, I would uh, still, we will still have the panel. We are running a little late, uh, but we will end on time. So for those of you who are in this panel, it will end at 3.45. Uh, and uh, first I'd like, to, and so what we will do is we will have a sort of an informal conversation and I'll, I'll try and mediate it as much as possible. Or, although I, I think you're such erudite speakers, that's probably not necessary. So I'll start by inviting Avni to the stage. I just saw you. There you are. OK. Uh, uh, Rohit Dhankar, Srinath Reddy, Sarojini. Please come to the dais. It would be great. I think everyone would love to hear from you. And I'll, I'll try and moderate from here. I think the disadvantage I think most of us have for panel sessions, regardless of you know any conference, is that you tend to get to miss out on at least one of the invited speakers, right? You have to, I mean, physically not yet possible to be in two places at once. Uh, but uh, so that's one of the, I mean, I wanted to give you a sense of why we decided to have this panel, because I think for those of us who have not been, you know, uh, in the conversations in the other panels, it's kind of good to hear from, from you, especially on um, the themes, the spe specific themes that you are engaged in or you were engaged in throughout the conference as well as in the in individual parallel sessions. So um, like I said, we have, we have about you know, 40, 45 minutes. And I would really like uh, uh, all of you to kind of engage with the kinds of things that you felt were very relevant. Uh, one, to the idea of institution building, uh, institution sustenance. <coughs> Um, as well, I mean, that could be larger than, you know, I mean, yes, we, we engaged with CVPS as an institution and independence and, you know, Aruna Roy, Shanta Sina spoke a little bit about, uh, and especially the panel uh, that, that was in the opening uh, plenary also spoke about, you know, how do you um, start engaging with conversations around democracy, around uh, the public, the idea of public, or the idea of independence, and how do we sort of start to un unpack it uh, or start to, you know, unpacking it is one aspect of it, but also how to engage with it. So my larger, I mean, uh, the larger question that I have for each of you is in that context, in the context of all that you've heard, in the, all, the, all the comments that you've seen, as well as the conversations that you've had in your parallel sessions, what would be uh, the most significant sort of uh, conversations that you would like, uh, at least those assembled to take forward or to engage with, and this is especially true for young scholars who are here. Uh, what what is the, because I think a lot of the time we f we we do want to you know one is you know what we've kind of experienced, but also um, uh, the anecdote that I have is uh, you know Sandhya Menon was a feminist who uh, passed away about five years ago. She said you know she was talking to me and she said a lot of the work that we did we focused so much on the law. So this was uh, about feminism and uh, w what kind of and, and during that time, there was this whole conversation we were having about inter, intergenerational feminism, you know, how, what kind of lessons are we learning? And I was saying, I was telling her, and I don't know if I convinced her, that, you know, standing on top, on the shoulders of giants is also, you know, it is a responsibility and it's a duty and it's, uh, it's really useful because if the, that conversation on legal aspects of the law didn't take place, then there was no way of saying, okay, the state now is held responsible for violence that is happening in private homes. Because till that point, that conversation didn't happen. Uh, so yes, the battles are not yet done. I mean, we are still fighting, as Aruna uh, Roy said, we should fight. Um, but I think the mandate, I guess, for this panel for you, uh, especially in the kind of conversation that I would like to take forward, is what do you feel are the sort of agenda setting things that in your domain areas you feel is critical for young scholars to take forward and also for us as an institution to start to engage with. Now, whether that's theoretical themes, empirical questions, anything that you feel we need to be mindful of. So thank you. And we can go with any order in, uh, in Avani was very clear that she didn't want to be first. Uh, so uh, we can start with uh, Dr. Reddy. 
given we'll, we'll go this way then i thought i had positioned myself out of your line of vision <laughs> It was not adequate. No, it's uh, it's just that at the either end you are kind of susceptible to. I know. <laughs> the tales of the distribution. Yes, exactly. yes. Well, I think for me it was a learning experience. I came here to learn, to listen, learn, and leverage my own knowledge, and build on that. And I think that was very useful for me. I think yesterday there was. A great deal of discussion in the sessions that I attended, obviously not both the parallel sessions, but the main plenary sessions, where there was clear concern about where the country is going, how academia and independent institutions of learning are getting increasingly vulnerable and therefore muted in their expression of views and th the question was whether we can afford to do that and continue to get further silenced. But I think there was also a clear-cut call in terms of knowledge being generated that we need a lot more of multidisciplinary learning to be translated effectively into multi-sectoral application. And that this requires very active engagement with support to and participation of the community. And therefore, it is important for academia to not only look at community as an object of study, but as a very important participant and partner in the whole job of knowledge creation, knowledge translation, implementation and even monitoring. I think that came out fairly clearly. In terms of uh, multidisciplinary learning and research, while I think that is something that is very eloquently subscribed to by most people, the incentives and disincentives for that were not adequately discussed and I don't think there was an opportunity to do that. Why is it that despite wanting to do that, many institutions do not do it? Because of siloed funding streams, because which are actually focused only on certain subject areas, the lack of incentives for promotion, because if you are doing a multidisciplinary research and multi-institutional research at that, how do you split the credits? How do you get the credits for prom academic promotion? So all of them ultimately forced you into a narrow stream because you're trying to pursue your own academic career as well. So what are the kind of institutional reforms that are required for that? And that's going to be very important. I think the other element is that since this kind of multidisciplinary research requires a great deal of exploration with multiple streams of knowledge coming in, it is very important to actually build partnerships among institutions and not necessarily believe that one single institution can drive that process forward. And how do we do that? By creating an ecosystem which is not vulnerable to the ego system. I think that is going to be an important element that we must address. But I think what really made me very pleased that I came is not only to hear the people yesterday crying out for a change in the overall social climate so that the current stifling environment is somehow loosened, but much more importantly, the active engagement of young researchers who are displaying both their talent and commitment to pursue knowledge and to try and find areas where they can apply it best for public good. The fact that it is public good that is coming up uppermost is very clear. And it's not just merely 
a personal gratification which researchers are usually accused of, but the idea of actually doing it for public good. One area we did not actually explore, even when we are talking about governance or about knowledge creation or knowledge application, is where do these public-private partnerships fit in? Currently at the moment, what is their ethos? What is their governance structure? What are the deliverables? What are the accountability mechanisms, particularly public accountability? Those are issues we have not discussed, I think, in adequate depth, and that needs to be discussed. We believe that PPP should ideally be redefined as partnership for a public purpose. So define the public purpose, define the deliverables, and clearly delineate the accountability mechanisms. And then only we will be able to achieve the objective recognizing that all stakeholders in society must combine their energies for public good. But while health is recognized clearly as a market failure, we still see the market forces now encroaching much more prominently into health and other areas of public good as well. So that is where I think we must really see where in independent institutions can actually generate knowledge but also stoke public awareness as to how that can be somehow calamitous for us, but offer also well-argued alternatives. I think there was sufficient strength in what was done in this conference. Obviously, a two-day conference or one-and-a-half-day conference cannot achieve all those objectives, but I think every moment that I spent here was both enlightening and energizing. So thank you very much. I would um, echo what Dr. Redley said. That every moment has been very, very rewarding and a huge learning experience. I'll talk a little bit about the role of independent institutions in a more limited way in the context of the panel that I was associated with, which was on gender in public spaces. Um, the reason I want to do that is because I think that gender and women in the old sense actually related to independent institutions in a way different to many sectors. Uh, the women's movement has always had a very close relationship with the nature of change in what happened to women in legislation and the effect of schemes. And this didn't start today. It started with the Mathra rape case, we have the Nirbhaya thing, we have the Justice Verma Committee. I mean, all that has come as a result of public voices, public articulation of the need for change. That is something which is a space which I think we had a very strong movement. I think the voices are becoming less um, uh, one doesn't, I mean, it's not possible to be as vocal as one was, but I think it's something that one um, needs to bear in mind, and it hasn't always been through the root of public action. It has also been through the root of change through public legislation, etc. All the changes, if you think of, of um, the Bishaka case, that's the result of a PIL that was actually filed by Naina Kapoor, and it resulted in first the sexual harassment gauze lines and later led to Posh. So what I'm saying is that there is a role, whether it's for the judiciary, for the you know, movement, and for NGOs, to actually bring about change. And I'm talking about it because one is the change in legislation, which is structural. But there is also a huge change, and that is also where role can be played, is being played, has been played by civil society. Uh, you know, civil society has often, through pilots, through interventions, 
demonstrated how things could work, need to be done. Uh, just now, you know, uh, there's this um, foundation called Transform Rural India Foundation. And for instance, in Madhya Pradesh, it started off by setting up one in a cluster, a place for justice for sexual harassment at a cluster level in, in district for a Nari Shakti Kendra. That was picked up and has been replicated throughout the state. So what I'm saying is it's a model that was set up by TRIF, which was picked up and replicated. So let's not think we can't. The issue is, of course, when civil society does stuff, is to, is the issue of scale. TRIF fortunately has that relationship with the government in four states and in the government of India and certain ministries that it can bring about scale. That's the thing, but we can certainly, as civil society, influence the way things are done. The other thing, you know, we had to, uh, just drawing again on yesterday's experiences, there were some, I would say, excellent papers. Of course, they're not completed, but there were such excellent papers. I also have something to do with a civil society organization in Delhi, I work with others, and I always find one of the things that I would say bothers me and also I feel we need to think a lot about is the fact that we there is excellent work out there. And there's a lot of work that needs to be heard by policy makers. Somehow, I feel that closing of the loop is something that we are not actually very, I mean, uh, very effective. I belong to a feminist policy collective. They send things to the ministry, et cetera, et cetera. But I really think, and I want to go back to you know, the role of the media now, is I actually think that articles in the press have much more readership and actually are taken note of by whoever. You know, it's very, very interesting. You see an article which says something about some policy in the Indian Express, the following day you get something from a government person trying to, in a cloak term, government person or somebody who's been put up by government. To, so that's being taken care of, that's being noticed. So I would say, rather than erudite journals, which yes, they have to be also published in, but convert it into something which can be taken care of. I find now so many articles are being referred to all the time, you know, which is, you know, is this thing from such and such newspaper, etc. So I would just say that closing the loop is really, really important. And I sometimes think, you know, there are organizations like CBGA, CBPS, ISST, coming out with excellent policy briefs. Sometimes I think maybe there should be some kind of a platform where we do very systematically dissemination of this because there's a lot of good work. Lastly, I'll talk a little bit about the academic role. Of course, in, there is two streams. One is the fact that, honestly, um, in, in, in the government universities, there are these, they still continue, the women's studies centers. Their output has been something that is not necessarily very visible. It varies from universe. But I think that's some place where one could work with and start looking at trying to make some alliance so they produce something. I would lastly just say one thing. You know, there is the role of independent institutions, but it's amazing how within governmental structures there are individuals who make, individuals make a huge difference whether it's in government or otherwise. And I think, especially for gender, it's very important to find out who your allies are. You will find allies there, I mean, I'm sure anybody who's worked in gender will know allies in government who have pushed an agenda, male, female. And I think that's something we need to work with because when we are talking about policy discourse, it's amazing the kind of impact that can have. So I, I just feel that being able to know who those allies are is very, very important because I can think, and I'm sure if I do, that's how change comes about. 
Um, I think I'll stop there. That's it enough. Good afternoon, friends. Uh, originally, I was thinking of talking about something else, particularly highlighting uh, my penchant with more clearly defined idea of independence. But now, since time is very little, so I'll focus. I, I work in education, and particularly voluntary agencies who are involved with school education directly. So I'll focus from there and maybe some of the of what I say might be generalizable. Uh, if I come directly to the role, it seems to me that uh, about policy, critique, research, uh, implementation, and advocacy. Within advocacy, I particularly uh, think that we are not using um, Right to Education Act legally. I mean, we are not using enough. There are, if you go to the schools in the rural area, uh, it could definitely be proved that what is, uh, what, what the RT talks about, uh, that is not happening in the school, and that is legislable, and we are not taking it forward. So th I consider that also as part of. Uh, but at the same time, when you are working and this idea of uh, uh, independence is, uh, you know, or the top of the mind of the people and the government happens to be, all governments are, but this particular government happens to be somewhat uh, not very happy about critique, etc. Then there could be several different kinds of scenarios which can emerge and that I believe we will have to uh, take care of. Uh, I'll take an example, uh, an, an imaginary scenario, and we'll try to make certain points about uh, what I want to say, particularly on um, defining it more clearly, the idea. Imagine two sets of voluntary organizations. We recently have had our uh, education policy, new education policy. Now, uh, all over India, new curriculum frameworks are being developed. NCRT is taking the lead and every state, many of them have uh, published part of the documents and others are prepared. Now imagine there are two sets of um, uh, voluntary agencies, uh, what we call these days NGOs, two sets of NGOs uh, who have adequate expertise in developing curriculum, uh, um, deciding about various kinds of relationship between aims of education and uh, pedagogy as well as content and all that. They have expertise in that as well as teacher training and developing this thing. One set of these NGOs is highly critical, suppose, of the uh, uh, new education policy. And on very legitimate grounds, they might feel, I'm not saying that there is really such, such a set of NGOs, but imagine that they feel that the uh, new education policy foregrounds the economic development aims, uh, gives priority to them over the critical citizen development aims. And they have part of their mandate as their uh, registration, etc., emphasize more on the development of critical citizen and awareness of people uh, about equality, social justice, etc. And they feel that this policy is lacking in giving adequate importance to that. Part one. Second, suppose that they also feel that policy has no business of, uh, of listing what should be in the curriculum. Policy should simply give, this is their idea of policy, national education policy, that uh, policy should simply uh, give the guidelines for selecting the uh, curricular content, not list the curricular content. And last, suppose they are very resentful of policy advocating a particular pedagogy because pedagogies are always uh, controversial, and there could be more than one pedagogy for the same educational aims, etc. This is part one. Now there is another set of NGOs who appreciate whatever is written in this policy and completely together with the government, uh, sorry, with the policy, forget about the government, together with the policy, and they agree with everything is happening in this. 
NCERT and SCERTs are responsible for developing curriculum or curricular frameworks and material, etc. Naturally, the set B would be preferred, and set A, in that sense, actually would be sidelined. Personally, I feel that NCRT or SCRT or the government would be legitimate in doing that, and that's not an injustice with that first set of NGOs. Why do I feel that? Because the government has come up with a policy that set of NGO may not agree uh, that the policy came through the fair democratic procedure and through the consultations, etc., and this is now accepted by the cabinet or whomsoever, whatever the, uh, the authority in that. And therefore, this is the policy and the government has the right to make that policy. Now, my constitutional right as the part of the set A NGO is also there that I can disagree with this policy. I can critique this. I, I see that this is take our education in the wrong direction. This, I see that this will ruin our curriculum and pedagogy. So this is my right as a citizen. I can talk about it, but can I claim that the government should take me on board in this process of developing a new curriculum framework because they want their curriculum framework to be consistent with the policy? So it seems to me that so far, uh, I as, as an NGO may feel very um, dissatisfied with it, but I don't seem to have ground to say that either I am uh, mm, sort of some injustice has happened with me. Let's go to the next level. Suppose, said A and you, I am pretty happy with, with this thing. Okay, if you want to develop a curriculum of this nature, go ahead. But I take the job of research and critique and publishing articles and publishing research, etc., which actually uh, shows the problems with the curricula and, and policy. And now the government stops my funding from another uh, project. Now, I think here something is happening, and this is the time when perhaps we should come together and try to resist it. There could be a third thing. Uh, this is not my, my funding is stopped, the government funding. Suppose I don't take any, any funding from the government. But suppose my FCRA is cancelled and uh, um, court cases are instituted, instituted against me for income tax. Uh, now I think the government is acting, uh, uh, trying to victimize um, this, this particular set of NGOs. Uh, this last thing, it seems to me that requires one more strain in, the, um, in, in, um, in thinking about independence. So far since yesterday we have been talking about the external pressure on the NGOs or independent bodies uh, to guard their independence. I have been saying since yesterday, my question was also related, there is another aspect to it. Shouldn't we reflect on our own ways of functioning and whether we have a clear kind of mandate in terms of our objectives and our commitment to objective rational research and making a rational judgment? Or are we being uh, let me go back to my NGOs. Suppose this first set of NGOs are extremely critical of this policy, but the points they bring out to be critical about this policy were already there in 68 policy and 88 policy, sorry, 86 policy. Now there seems to be an issue with the independence of the NGO itself internally. Because if a certain provision is there in a policy by government A, uh, this NGO doesn't seem to be critical of this and they accept it pretty happily. And if a, a similar kind of provision by the government B, it seems that now the vision and the objectivity of the NGO itself is compromised because their political agenda and direct party political agenda is taking over. So the strain I want to say is that first we have to be true to our objectives and uh, second, we have to reflect on ourselves. Last thing I would say is that uh, how can small NGOs, I, I mean, this, this organization is too big for us, how can small NGOs maintain their uh, independence? I think there are three or four very simple things. One is 
as I already said, commitment to the objectives. Second is uh, open-minded and um, objective inquiry and commitment to truth, which I have been saying several times. The third is constant uh, collaborative reflection, that within the organization, people who are giving direction to the organization, they constantly reflect where they are going and whether they are true to these two first principles. And this would be much better if this, uh, this uh, mm, mm, reflection is being done in the presence of an uh, external person who is who can play a devil's advocate. Uh, I believe that this kind of internal mechanism will strengthen us. Why am I saying this thing? Civil society organizations uh, will be much more credible if we are in the habit of self-reflecting and clearly remain on the objective side and perhaps we will be much more effective in, in that thing. Now, I actually know the NGOs who fall in the category A, as I said, and they are going through this struggle and perhaps these internal mechanisms help them up to a certain extent. Thank you. Over the past few weeks, um, for obvious reasons, one question that I've personally been asking myself and I think um, all of us at CPR is, what is the role, purpose, and impact of independent institutions? Um, and, I, and I lead an, an initiative called Accountability Initiative. So we get asked that question a lot um, by everyone saying accountability, accountability by whom, uh, to whom, for what? Um, and I think this conference is, again reinforced um, for me the three things that I believe are a critical role that independent institutions play. Um, so thank you so much for organizing um, this. Um, I think the first role that um, every independent um, institution, particularly um, a lot of the research institutions and think tanks, um, which, I, which is what I know best, um, is of course the role of knowledge generation, but it's not just knowledge generation itself, because knowledge generation is done by a large number of groups. I think what's unique about the role that independent institutions can play is generating knowledge on things that are, may not be flavor of the day. Um, it's important to bring to light topics that aren't getting attention. So my colleague Tanya presented some of the work on underreporting of um, gender-based violence, it's not a sexy topic right now. No one's really talking about it. And I think that's an important thing that institutions can do of bringing to light things that may not be the, the focus of the moment of the day. And the reason that we can do that in some ways is because of, as Dr. Eddy said, the multidisciplinary nature of how many of our, us are designed. It requires multiple approaches, the ability to work across a range of topics. Um, at any given moment, any country is facing a series of complex challenges. Um, and so while it's natural that governments may prioritize certain over others, I think an important role for all of us is to bring to light those that are underreported, under, not as visible, but yet deeply important. Um, the other thing that I think is really important is ground truthing. And again, what was fascinating is that so much of that came out in the discussions, um, even the one that we just had um, just before, um, the idea of looking at ICDS data, ground truthing that with what's happening on the ground. Um, I think everyone would agree that new ideas spur innovation, but you can't innovate till you know what's working and what's not working. Um, and in fact, government themselves often ask us these questions of, help us ground truth. Um, um, I remember many years ago sitting in the office of the Ministry of um, that time Human Resource Development, where someone asked us to go and collect data, secondary data as well, not just primary, um, in education in a few states. And I was really confused. I was, um, I, I asked him that, but sir, you already have access to all that data. Why should we go and collect it, which will be a pain because we'll need permission letters and we'll have to go to the field. And he said, Avni, 
I know very well sitting on top as MHRD that when I ask for data, um, the kind of data that I get, or I'm often told what they think I want to hear. And um, it's for people like you and organizations like, like you, um, which can help us verify, cost correct, um, and actually um, play that important role of trying to spur innovation by knowing what's working and what's not. I think the second area that I think um, independent institutions play an important role is in brokering ideas and socialization. I think yesterday Aruna Ji spoke about how the RTI move, it started off as a campaign, went to a bill, and then finally there was a movement. Um, and it required getting a lot of people across different states to buy into that idea, to also get feedback from everyone to say whether this is going to work or not. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a billion uh, Aruna Roy's um, in the world, but that's where I think institutions can play an important role um, because we do have access and networks and it's important to validate ideas, it's important to validate policies, it's important to get feedback um, <coughs> from different stakeholders and again, this is something that I think is much needed and um, an important role that we can all play. Um, the last thing in some ways is um, an important one, which is we can act as intermediaries, intermediaries between decision makers and those and communities working on the ground. And I think that's again something that came out very, very strongly um, throughout the day, um, yesterday as well, but also through some of the presentations that people were discussing. Um, so I think on one hand, one important role that we can play is kind of decoding and simplifying this complex maze called governance. Um, we've, I work a lot on budgets and they are such technical documents that actually just simplifying them and it was really nice to see in the audience people who are investigative journalists and media who have are taking an interest in budgets now um, because of different organizations that are working on simplifying often seen as very technical um, terminologies. Um, but it's also important to do the other side, which is how do you take back your learnings um, and of communities and give them a voice, which sometimes is difficult to do. So as you were saying, there are so many small, small NGOs, they may not have access to everyone. And I think that's where um, independent institutions can play a role of taking their research, their learnings, their voices um, to um, important stakeholders across the board. Um, I think uh, we, f <coughs> we need that. Um, there are a lot of opportunities to do some of these um, sharing the ground realities. And I think that there is definitely interest as well. Um, as Sarojini ji said, I think a few things that for all the young uh, researchers who are going to probably set up institutions um, or already have, I think a few lessons that I have learned and I'm still um, nascent in this space. One of which is that um, neither government nor policy making um, is this monolithic creature. And that's what, as you were saying, there are always, I think it's, it's good to avoid reductionist conversation and it's always useful to find allies and partners. And we've always been amazed and surprised by it. Um, the, not just the example of MHRD, but I remember even in a very, very politically sensitive time when the Swachh Bharat mission was coming to an end. Um, we had people in the district saying, we know that we haven't re received open defecation free status. Uh, we know that we will need to show that we have achieved open defecation free status, but go out there and tell us what's working, what's not, so that after we have kind of shown the numbers, we can actually work towards it. So there are lots and countless people who are looking for, relying on independent institutions. So. Um, I did want to say that there is a positive side to it, even in um, bleak times. Um, I think the second thing um, is kind of taking what you're saying, which is it's important to be true to your purpose, um, definitely. Um, it's very easy to follow the funding. It's very easy to follow the trends of the time. Um, but I think that's when the word independent and institutions and their role gets diminished. So. Um, is not saying it's easy and it, you may not be 100% successful, but I think that's another important lesson um, that I've kind of learned. Um, and that could be by finding allies and partners as well. 
I also think that what amazed me when I first joined um, CPR is that it's important to have that intern. This, what you, what when we talk about democratic values and freedom of speech and expression, it's important to inculcate them within, the, within organizations as well. Um, so when I first joined, I remember seeing in the Indian Express op-ed pages different faculty members within CPR saying completely contradictory things, and it was totally okay. Um, in fact, when you if you see this year's reactions to the union budget, you will see that there is complete difference of opinion, and that's totally okay. Um, not saying that anyone is right or wrong, it's totally from where we come from. So when I'm looking at it from a welfare perspective, I think it's not doing enough, but when someone's looking at it from a fiscal stability and macroeconomics perspective, they would think that it's a great budget. Um, and I think having those spaces um, is definitely um, critical and important. And I think last but not the least, um, I think it's very easy to get caught in a trap of saying we need solutions, we need impact. And I'm not saying that either of those things are not important, um, but also trust the process. Um, it's not, I, I'm always hesitant to say, here is a template solution that I think will work across every geography in India when we know for a fact that that's not true. Um, it's the process of arriving at solutions or thinking through what the challenges are which have equal uh, merit and value. And so we've also been trying to focus on, a lot on methodology documentation rather than saying, this is what you should do. Here are different methods of analyzing a problem and coming up with solutions. So I'll pause here. Thank you so much. OK, so um, kind of over short time. <laughs> but uh, can we take about five minutes for audience questions? Uh, because I think it would be nice to, I have a few, I had a question, but I think it would be better if, because I, I can speak to you later, but uh, if we can have about just five more minutes, any audience questions? Yes, Prashant, uh, is there a mic? Yeah. I'm actually now feeling so bad now because there are so many of these conversations that we've had in the other panels as well about process. So I, I, I think it was, kind of coming together. So I'm, I'm hoping that there is, um, at some point, we will write this up and share it with you. Because those of you who missed the other session will know that actually what the speakers uh, kind of spoke about actually coincides a lot and has this sort of uh, nice synthesis um, and symmetry, which is always useful. No mic? Yes. Oh. Um, uh, one question and one reflection, uh, just to introduce first. yourself, Prashanti. Yeah. I am Prashanti, uh, representing Bhumika Women's Collective, coming from Telangana, Hyderabad. Um, just, Ma'am Sarojini, you mentioned about uh, TRIF and the uh, social justice system that has been uh, uh, introduced by TRIF. Uh, I would actually uh, recall the Nariya Dalits that are started by Maila Samakya much, much before that. So <laughs> uh, how we promote those models as models and interact with government to take it as a model and replicate across the country is very important. That's what uh, I think Maila Samakya uh, <laughs> lost. Uh, the other point, uh, I, I, it's a question actually. Uh, institutions, small institutions, sustainability. When it comes to a small organizations started by women and women-headed NGOs are in a big uh, trouble now, um, especially with the FCRA rules and uh, uh, not having local funds, sufficient local funds, or CSR, tapping the CSR funds. So how would we uh, deal with this situation and how you see uh, what can be done for uh, helping the small women-headed uh, institutions to sustain themselves? Thank you, Prashanti. We'll take two more questions and then we'll get to the panel. Yes, ma'am. Please introduce yourself and ask. Yeah, this is Shashank. I'm a PhD scholar here at NIAI. Um, I have been keenly listening to uh, all the speakers. Uh, interesting notes, uh, but I also wanted to ask if uh, any of them would be willing to reflect on what is the spaces captured by independent institutions in the policy domain that make it much more difficult for the uh, uh, 
civil society groups to uh, work and push for their agendas and what is the relationship between civil society groups movements public movements uh, people's movements and institutions as well okay. one more question anyone else okay i think the panel can discuss and anyone prefers to respond i can no? take one question but sure. so okay. maybe you should take the women's question okay i'll i'll try uh, what you said is very true i mean at the moment the space for getting finance is definitely shrinking we know the whole regulation around fcra has become more stringent but actually what is slightly i don't know my personal experience has not my own has not been very positive but i know people who have uh, actually worked on trying to capitalize on csr now my own experience of csr has been that quite a lot of organization want either big <coughs> big ticket items where they can say they're funding so many things so it becomes more difficult for a small ngo or uh, they give money to pm cares or something where they can show <coughs> they've given it but actually if you have in your vicinity csr is something which now because they're bound by law and rules to to and the rules say that if there's something in your locality it's a good thing it's one thing the second thing is if your collective is 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 registered under um I mean, if it's one of the collectives which is recognized under NRLM, there's a big push this year, actually, about funding individual women and making each one, I mean, theoretical, but they're trying to work towards it. This for the first time they have gender, is trying to make each woman member uh, what they call Lakpati. And as a result, the levels of loaning and thing are theoretically, I, I've not seen it in practice yet, supposed to go up. But so, I mean, I, I really don't know what buttons you can push, but those are the ones that come to mind immediately. And I would just say there are people in this room who would probably be much better equipped to give you some sort of advice. If anybody else can add to what I'm saying, that would be useful. You, you had something you wanted? Well, let me take up the question on uh, <coughs> people's movements and uh, independent organizations, what relationship they can have. Is it a conflicting relationship that somebody is taking up somebody else's space, or is it a complementary relationship? They're working together towards a common objective. I believe it should be the latter, and if it's not, we must remedy that situation. Uh, clearly, there are different roles that each organization can play. Independent institutions which are creating knowledge, translating knowledge, and critiquing knowledge, or evaluating the application of knowledge, will come up with perspectives based on whatever evidence they've gathered and analyzed. But the message must actually be widely disseminated through the media, through all other channels, so that the people who are engaged much more in the front lines in people's movements will have both the ammunition for their arguments and adequate amount of information on which they can build popular movements. Uh, ultimately, policymakers will have to, re will usually respond, are supposed to respond to two types of approaches. One is the cognitive element where you can give them a lot of information, particularly if it's a economics-based argument, but you also need an emotive component where there is a clear-cut factor of some group being clearly disadvantaged or there is an outrage factor of popular discontent being voiced. I mean, for example, tobacco, nobody bothered about tobacco till secondhand smoke came up. And when it was found that people who are non-smokers were getting hurt, the outrage built up. So I think it's absolutely important for us to act in unison so that people who are in independent institutions who are actually conducting the research or translating the research 
see themselves as informed facilitators of popular movements and pass on that message and assist them in amplifying it further and ensuring that there is a response. I think that is the element. Coming back to FCRA, it's a terrible situation, but one possible way in which you can get around it, and I suppose there is no government person in IB taking notes, yeah. is uh, that firstly, if there is a large NGO which is getting a grant, it cannot share it with a, another NGO even if it is FCRA registered under the new rules. But work can be contracted out and that money can be paid for. Or some people can be employed to work with that NGO but paid directly by the NGO which has got the grant. So you'll have to work around some of those mechanisms if possible, but certainly that's only a, a solution which is not most comfortable. So we'll have to try and see how we can try and ask for and get the FCRA rules amended in a more meaningful fashion. But till that time, these are possibilities. Would anyone else like to respond to any of the questions? I think Dr. Eddie, I was going to respond to the complementarity, um, and I think you said it better than I can. So. <laughs> okay. uh, actually, I was going to say the same thing, that uh, the, the one of the things that uh, I think in the health session was uh, was very clear is that you know the idea of and, and the thing is in this panel so if I can summarize in two minutes in this panel and especially especially in the last I think the entire two uh, two days if I have to say that what I've learned is that the the inclusion of something doesn't necessarily mean that the exclusion of something else and and the thing is a lot of the conversations yesterday also spoke about the the, the value of diversity and the value of engaging with diversity of organizations and not necessarily so independent organizations come in all forms just like you know civil society organizations come in all forms and social movements come in all forms they're not necessarily um, I mean if you look at any kind of social movements they're not necessarily internally all the time progressive either right so the kinds of ideas that you bring forward who speaks and you, you may, I mean, I know you are laughing, but the thing is there are a lot of conversations around, for example, gender caste conversations within, for example, certain kinds of social movements that are not always articulated. And I'm not saying this coming from an independent institution. I'm talking to you from the voices of the people I have spoken to. And that is the role of the independent organization, is to be able to say, yes, you're right, absolutely. And the thing is the panel has been saying it. And the thing is something that I think it's always so important for all of us to engage with is the criticality of self-reflection and the idea that there is um, there needs to be a sort of a way in which um, and I'll go back to again the health question about you know our commitment in some ways I mean and the thing is uh, the commitment to social change and what that means and so if that means that we are and I applaud you for that question if that means we have to hold a we hold ourselves accountable to someone whom we are getting the con I mean who are who we feel are the communities we are interacting with that's absolutely something that we need to be accountable to as well and holding ourselves accountability is something that is one of our responsibilities and I think that's what you're I, I'm assuming referring to and that I think is something that we have been sort of having a conversation about that whether it's with gender with health and I'm assuming with um, public finance and with education is I mean, like you said, who, who is it that we're accountable to? I mean, and these are questions we ask of ourselves and we need to ask of communities as well. I mean, it's, I mean, everyone is implicated by power, right? And so that's, I mean, when we talk about intersectionality, that's what we mean, that everybody is implicated by power and so are we. And I think one of the really learnings, and I'm, I'm gonna take two minutes to just, uh, I think in, talk about at least what I have learned in the panel as well as in the last two days is the is one the importance of public good second um, I've always already spoke about diversity um, and then of course you know what that also means is diversity of methods multidisciplinarity multiple lenses right so we tend to kind of focus and one of the most amazing things about for me at least was that I was sitting on panels that I had you know very limited disciplinary lens understanding and yet I was able to see how, you know, the, the way in which um, Professor Srinath said that the person who is experiencing lived experiences does not see it in different disciplinary lenses, right? 
we see it together and in a lot of ways if you can engage with knowledge in that form in the way that it's very complicated and it is complex and yet what the panel i feel was trying to say is that there is a clarity in that complexity there needs to be clarity and one of the roles of independent organizations in collaboration with govern uh, governing bodies in collaboration with social movements in collaboration with the other actors who are forming the social space is to bring certain forms of clarity and voice to that complexity because there are multiple voices there is no singular voice out there and we do need to have that voice captured um the other thing that i felt was very useful is you know uh, rohithankar's con conversation and i thought of this as a socratic method of you know constantly asking why 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 does this happen and you know the reflection and the open mindedness and to be able to have honestly the courage to be answering that question as well right so if someone is asking that question saying you have to be held accountable for what you're saying to be able to say okay that's something that you know we will take responsibility for but also asking questions around um you know professor srinath in his previous said you know there are multiple truths out there there isn't a one singular holistic sort of truth and to be able to find those you know as what you were saying to uh, diversity of truths but maybe perhaps you know nuance that a little bit and not say diversity of opinions right because that constantly becomes the thing where you say i believe this and so therefore that could be the truth but you know there is a a system and there is a method and there is a process to truth truth telling and to truth understanding the multiple truths that are out there and that i think is what i think a lot of conversation around rigor comes around about when when multiple people are saying this how do how do you cut across a lot of the noise a lot of the conversation and and really articulate what communities want what women want what marginalized people want and perhaps also cutting across government documents because sometimes cutting through the that i mean i have seen i i, I am in a budget organization so i know exactly what you mean when you say the 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 numbers can be very heavy and i'm sure a lot of people who have to deal with it uh, are smiling but um there is a sense in which we can we can cut through that and arrive at not perhaps simple solutions but at least ones that might work um and i think uh, i think the the idea of expanding the engagement not just with government but with different ways of uh, i like the idea of ally making right uh, and the and the very especially in the gender session we were talking about how do we how do we engage with different kinds of uh, diverse identities uh, and ally making seems you know when i came across that word because you know you come across that um, you're a gender ally which means that you are you may you may be implicated by the invisibility of privilege that you you know in, is inhabited in your body and your identity but you can still be an ally that you can still move from your subject position to inhabit someone else's world to be able to say i will i engage i mean i can i, I can work with i i, I not just i can work with you but i can um you know your interests are um, are also in actually in my self interest um and to be ha having that commitment also means to to see public policy as a political act and i think if josna was here and i'm sorry i didn't announce this earlier she's a little unwell which is why she's also not moderating this panel but i think she would agree with me that for us at least at cbps we do see this as a public policy as a political act i mean regardless of whether that is formulating the questions what questions to ask what are the methods that we use who do we engage with when we ask these questions how do we represent because representation is a big thing in terms of you know writing um who how do we represent them who do we talk to and as anita was pointing out in our previous session do we take this back to our communities or do they become part of that process of policy making those are questions of those are political decisions those are not necessarily so in that sense um i think you've given us actually a lot of um things to think about and i think the last point that i'd like to say is that uh, i think your your conversations around the importance of absent actors who is not present here who is not part of this conversation is also i mean i think it has been something that we have been um, conscious of but it is something that we can continue to be very vigilant about is who you know the importance of absent actors in forming the social space 
is actually quite pivotal in allowing us to understand that social space. So your uh, conversations around space and time that, you know, a lot of things change. Uh, you know, for example, women, when provided space and time, women, you know, have the abilities to figure out their own kind of uh, resolutions, have the ability to um, understand their own social worlds with, you know, great ease. I think that's also something that we can, I mean, we can be committed to, is to give ourselves some space and time to critique, to advocate, uh, and as uh, we were saying, to be able to m make visible that which is not right now. So I thank you for your immense contributions, not just today in this panel, but also in directing the conversations in the other panels, and thank you so much for participating in our conversation. Thank you. <laughs>